I have to look more closely at it. We had a train of thought going. So give me a sec. We were looking at, and the reason I want to do this one, not so much for the calculus, but for the trig. Because it's solving a trig equation. And this is something people inevitably have a pretty hard time with at first, right? So if we're trying to we're, we're trying to find the places where the values of C guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Let's kind of catch our breath on this one from yesterday. So we were given this function on an interval, and we have, remind me real quick, what are the criteria for the mean value theorem? Um. The function has to be what? In order for the mean value theorem to apply, it has to be smooth, good. So it has to be continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, right? So this one is clearly, I mean, this is pretty, we can just look at this in, by inspection. You know we've got sine functions, and so it's continuous everywhere. When we take the derivative, we've got cosine functions. No problems there. So we meet the criteria. Then to find the values of C, we're just going to, you know, we're going to apply the mean value theorem. We want to know where does the derivative equal the difference quotient, right? So f of pi minus f of 0, let me make a little note of that about. So this is f of pi minus f of 0 over pi minus 0, which is just 0, okay? So we've got to solve that equation, but that's where all the action is on a problem like this. How do you solve that trig equation, right? So the trig equation, we, we looked at this, it's ugly, right? Because we can cancel the twos, but we've still got cosines of x and cosines of 2x, and that doesn't work well, right? So we've got to get the same angles in there. So we, you know, we derived the, the appropriate trig identity, right? So for us it was, which one did we want? We wanted the cosine of 2x. Cosine of 2x, we can swap out for 2 cosine squared x minus 1. And so now it looks much better. Now we've got, we chose this one because it, this is the trig identity for cosine 2x that uses cosines only, right? So now we've got, a, we've got an equation with cosines of x, and that's it. All right, so what we want to do now is we want to the next step is, in order to solve a trig equation, you first have to solve for a trig function. And then you're going to find the places where the trig function has the specific values, the solutions, right? So what I mean by that is, we've got 2 cosine squared x plus cosine x minus 1. That's a quadratic function in cosine x. So if we, if we think about this in chunks of cosine x, I've got 2 times cosine x squared plus cosine x minus 1. Think of the cosine x as being like a u, for example. Like if we were to make this little variable substitution, just to make this thing look a little nicer, what if we said u equals cosine x? Then doesn't this just end up being 2u squared plus u minus 1 equals 0? See my point? Right? So it's a quadratic equation. In U, that's one we can factor. <coughs> so I want to, we're going to, which way do I want to have, where do I want to attach my factors of negative 1? Do I want to put the negative 1 there and the positive 1 there or vice versa? Think about when we multiply it out. We could try them both. Right? You can just try them both and see. When I multiply it out, obviously I'm going to get my 2u squared and my minus 1, but which one's going to give me my cross product of u? Well, this one's going to give me a positive 2u minus u, so that one works, doesn't it? Right? The bottom one's going to give me the wrong sign. I'm going to get a minus 2u plus a u as a negative u, so that's the one that we want. We want the 2u minus 1 times u plus 1 equals 0, right? Okay, but they're not u's. They're cosine x's, right? So let's take go to the next page here.
So we're going to swap back then. We'll swap back for the, the u's are going to become cosine x's. So 2 cosine x minus 1 times cosine x plus 1 equals 0. We didn't really even have to, to, to apply that variable substitution. It just makes it a little easier to see. In hindsight now, can you see that we're, tr we're trying to factor this so we're getting cosine x's? They're showing up in the factors. Okay, so then by the zero product property, what would our solutions be? Right? We, we know that we've got a product of factors equals zero. So the solutions are going to be, we know that this factor equals zero when cosine x equals what? If I set that equal to zero and solve, what would I get? Uh, arc, uh, arc cosine. Well, I don't need any arc cosine. I said, well, what's cosine equal to? To one half. Right, we just want to know cosine x equals one half, or what's it going to equal here? Cosine x equals one. negative one. Okay, so we've solved for the trig function, right? Now we just have to find. Now it becomes a unit circle issue, right? We want to find the, the places where cosine has these values on our original where to go? Our original domain. Well, we're, we're going from zero to pi, right? So on the unit circle. Where is that going to happen? <coughs> In the unit circle, where is cosine x equal to 1 half? Well, let's make a unit circle and see. Right? So what's going to be the point that's going to have? Is that going to be an x or a y coordinate for cosine? Like, if I take this point right here, for example, that has coordinates u, v, and that's theta, Think back to trig. Cosine is x. Okay, so u would equal cosine theta, v would equal sine theta, right? So if we're at the one up here where the x coordinate is one half, what's the y coordinate going to be? Square root of three over two. Square root of three over two. Good. And then we're only looking for the we're on the interval where we're going from zero up to Pi, right? So on that interval, there's only going to be one place where x equals one half. It's going to be there. We wouldn't. This one is not in the in our domain, right? So that's going to be at an angle of pi over three, right? And so that's at theta equals pi thirds. So there's there's one solution. X equals pi thirds radians. What about negative 1? Where would x equal negative 1? Uh, Where would that x coordinate be negative 1 on the circle? Uh, at pi. At pi, good. So we get the spot right here, don't we? Negative 1, 0. So the other one is at x equals pi. Okay, are both of those guaranteed by the mean value theorem? There's our domain. Yes. You gotta be careful. No? Only one of them is. How come the one's an endpoint? One's an endpoint, right? The mean value theorem only guarantees values of C's on the open interval between the endpoints. So we only actually get one of it in this case. This is a that's a value of C, but this one we can discard because it's an endpoint. Okay? Make sense? And the main thing, I, the reason I want to go through that one is because of that trig equation. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Okay, here's the other one I really want to do, and then I'll stop. I'd be willing to quit after this one. This is, this is a really important calculus one. If you get this, you get a lot of stuff. If you don't get this, you're missing some points. So does the function satisfy the hypotheses of the mean value theorem on the given interval? Right. So do we meet the criteria? Is the function continuous and differentiable? Okay. Uh, on the interval, where's what is our interval in this case, by the way? What's the given interval? Negative three to negative one. Negative three to negative one. Okay. So here's the interval we're looking at. So we got to answer the question then, is it continuous? On negative 
negative 3 to negative 1. So that's one important question. And then is it differentiable? We know if it's continuous. Is it, well, we know that we've got a we got a piecewise function, right? So the first piece joins the second piece at <coughs> negative two, right? That's going to be the boundary. So if it's continuous, then that would mean that the limit from the left would equal the limit from the right. Agreed? Everybody see that that's the concept we're getting at there, right? If the limits weren't the same, there'd be a jump in the function and it wouldn't meet the criteria. So let's see, the limit of f of x as x approaches negative 2 from the left, what are we in the top or the bottom part of the function for that? Which piece? Top. Top, okay. So we're taking the limit of x squared minus x as x approaches negative 2 from the left, well, what do we get? That's an easy one to evaluate. 6. Yeah, I'm going to get 4 minus negative 2 is 6. Okay. The limit of f of x as x approaches negative 2 from the right, that'd be the bottom piece, right? Does that plus or minus really mean anything here in this case? I mean, it's giving us a direction, but when we're evaluating a limit, the value that we're approaching is just negative 2, isn't it? That's the value we're plugging in. So if I plug negative 2 in, what am I going to get? 2 times, so that's going to give me 2 times 4 is 8 <coughs> plus 4 minus 6 equals 6. Okay, so they, they're equal, aren't they? The limits from both sides are equal, so it is continuous, right? Is the function continuous? Yes, it is. Is it differentiable? Okay, this is the part that's harder to maybe see. How are we going to tell? Take the derivative of both sides and see if they're equal at negative ah, 2. Okay, good. So we're going to differentiate both of those. So if we, so f prime of x. going to equal the derivative of x squared minus x is what? Okay. What's the derivative of 2x squared minus 2x minus 6? Okay. And so those are going to be the value. This is going to be the value of the derivative to the left of the break, right? When x is greater than or equal to negative 3 and less than, but maybe not including, we can't tell yet, right? So we'll say when it's less than negative 2, here's the value of the derivative when x is greater than negative 2 and less than negative 1. And we got to be able to see if we take these limits, <coughs> do we get the same value in the middle, right? So if we take the limit of our derivative, the limit f prime of x as x approaches negative 2 from the left, that's that limit, right? What do we get? If we approach negative 2, negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, minus 1 is negative 5. Good. The limit of f prime of x as x approaches negative 2 from the right is the limit of this bottom part. If we plug that in, we're going to get negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. Well, those are not equal, right? So what's that tell us then? How would we interpret that? Sharp corner. Everybody agree? Sharp corner. As the ant walks 
towards negative two from the left, he, his slope sensor is telling him the slope is negative five. As he walks towards negative two from the right, the slope sensor is negative six. Those are different slopes. And so that's a sharp corner, right? So then, does it meet the criteria? No, it fails this one. It's not differentiable, right? You get a sharp corner there. So it's not differentiable. Big is questions answered. Plug in a little piece tomorrow on that, maybe.